your narrator calls the shots. If we're going all in on the idea that the narrator is the generator of the words your reader reads, and we are, then your narrator also controls quite a few other critical aspects of your story. One of these aspects is the narrative distance. The words your narrator places on the page will determine how your reader simulates the story just as much as the actions they're interpreting. Distance is about how close the reader feels to the action, and the narrator is paramount in this regard. We've already experienced this a little with a few of the passages in the last couple lessons, most notably when Tolkien walked us into the hobbit hole from the front door to the tube-like hallway with its many coat hooks and polished chairs, inviting us to envision the inside of Bilbo's comfy little home. Huck, on the other hand, didn't really do that in his opening paragraph. He just started talking, mostly about abstract things like the author, the other book you may remember him from, and the truth as a general concept. Huck hadn't invited us into the story world yet. The process of simulating the story requires a reader to take up a position relative to the action in order to envision it. Master storytellers have absolute command over this phenomenon. I'll show you what I mean. There's a scene early on in Moby Dick when Ishmael, the narrator, and his Polynesian companion, Queequeg, are on the deck of a ferry heading to meet their whaling ship in Nantucket. The boom gets loose, sweeping overboard a young man who had previously been harassing Queequeg for his appearance. Then this happens. Watch Melville do work. Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long, living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more, he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. I looked at the grand and glorious, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down. Shooting himself perpendicularly from the water, Queequeg now took an instant's glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, and he rose again, one arm still striking out, and with the other dragging a lifeless form. I was first drawn to this passage by the passive construction in the second sentence. He was seen, swimming like a dog. If you look at the other verbs in this paragraph, you'll notice that not only are they active verbs, they're lively ones at that. Stripped, darted, dived, rose. The passive verb here is to a purpose. Melville wants the reader on the deck visualizing this scene from afar, and you might be tempted to think, well, of course, it's a character narrator. The reader has to stay with the narrator. But this is Melville, not so. Ishmael puts the reader wherever he wants. Sometimes it's in the officer's mess where a lowly deckhand like Ishmael never ventures. Sometimes it's recounting the events on a whaleboat he wasn't even on. There's more than one scene where Ahab is alone and Ishmael relates Ahab's innermost thoughts, including one memorable Hamlet-like soliloquy with a whalehead. If Ishmael had wanted the reader to participate in the rescue alongside noble Queequeg, that would have been the paragraph I just read. No. Ishmael wants you on the deck of the ferry, watching as Queequeg negotiates the wintry dark waters of the frothing Atlantic. You belong back on the deck with the rest of the land-loving crew who have no place in those waters. Melville's giving the reader a sense of the character, a man with an almost supernatural familiarity with the sea, for which the reader, like Ishmael, should be properly reverent. Only Queequeg has business out there. Melville keeps you right where he wants you and moves you nowhere else. This is a master class in managing narrative distance, the crux of it done with a single passive construction surrounded by lively action verbs. Just so. There aren't many narrative theorists who have taken on the concept of immersion, that feeling you get when you're sucked into the story world. Fortunately for us, the one who has studied this phenomenon in greatest detail is Mary Laura Ryan and her observations are illuminating. For Ryan, the key moment in this telepathy game we're playing is when the narrator moves the reader into the story world, a moment she calls recentering. She also offers a very useful metaphor for the phenomenon, contrasting what she calls telescope perspective with a perspective I'm going to update and call virtual reality perspective when you put on the VR headset and go in.
Telescope perspective is the story world viewed from a great distance, as though through the lens of a telescope. The characters seem as objects to be viewed from afar. You might think of this as that first paragraph from Huck Finn. Huck hasn't given us anything to visualize, or a place from which to visualize it. There's a voice in the distance and a few disconnected, disembodied ideas, but no recentering, not even a Huck yet, per se. Three words could have changed that. Imagine a river. Boom, you're there. But Huck didn't do that. He kept you out at a distance. Let's look at a passage of pure telescope perspective and break it down. And who better to bring us some telescope perspective than the late great Carl Sagan, who might have stood amongst our finest full-time novelist if it hadn't been for that pesky day job unlocking the mysteries of the universe. This comes from the second chapter of Contact, as Sagan's narrator is introducing the college-age version of the protagonist, Ellie Arroway. At a time when many of her contemporaries were moving towards shapeless clothing that minimized the distinction between the sexes, she aspired to an elegance and simplicity in dress and makeup that strained her limited budget. There were more effective ways to make political statements, she thought. She cultivated a few close friends and made a number of casual enemies who disliked her for her dress, for her political and religious views, or for the rigor with which she defended her opinions. Now, it's not that I pulled a passage from this chapter out of context to show the one bit of narration from this distance. Much of this chapter unfolds like this. It's certainly not Sagan's most poetic bit of prose, but still, it's not bad writing by a long shot. This is merely working a different way, laying a foundation for a character that runs deep, and because of this groundwork, the reader understands Ellie more thoroughly as the story evolves. This passage treats Ellie a lot like an object viewed from a distance. The almost clinical way the narrator describes the character from this distance gives the reader a sense of the kind of cool, scientific mind Ellie makes her observations of the universe with, and this is critical to the story. Telescope narration for a story about an astronomer. How perfect. There aren't many direct visual cues in this passage. Perhaps one could visualize their own sense of an elegantly dressed college-age woman, but not much else. And we're not really there with Ellie, wherever she is over the course of the passage. The disembodied non-character narrator is far more prominent than Ellie is. And you might have noticed that, in contrast to that vivid scene with Queequeg, this passage unfolds over a much longer period. It's likely that years of Ellie's life are being described in this fragment of a paragraph. This is a clue that duration also plays a role in narrative distance. In order for a reader to easily recenter and take up a position inside the story world, place and time have to permit. So elements that are easily visualized, as well as a time frame close to the speed of life, are going to help ignite the process of recentering. If you want to stay out at a distance, as Sagan's narrator does here to good effect, you should follow the characteristics of the passage we noted: a non-character narrator, few visual cues to spatial or specific events, summary rather than scene, and little or no dialogue. Let's get a little closer now. This is the opening from a famous short story by Ursula K. Le Guin. With a clamor of bells that set the swallows soaring, the festival of summer came to the city of Omalas, right towered by the sea. The rigging of the boats in the harbor sparkled with flags. In the streets between houses with red roofs and painted walls, between old moss-grown gardens and under avenues of trees, past great parks and public buildings, processions moved. Some were decorous, old people in long, stiff robes of mauve and gray, grave master workmen, quiet, merry women carrying their babies and chatting as they walked. In other streets, the music beat fast, a shimmering of gong and tambourine, and the people went dancing. The procession was a dance. The first few sentences here have a similar feel to The Hobbit, with a narrator that isn't specifically identified introducing a place and a time that seems removed from the telling of the tale. It's a beautiful opening sentence that places that city of Omelas out there somewhere, and gives the reader a few cues to visualize, like soaring swallows, bright towers, and the sea. But there isn't specifically a place for the reader's consciousness to take up residence, especially as the paragraph progresses. The narrator continues to give nice visual cues, the boats in the harbor, the red-tiled roofs, the moss-covered gardens, but they come in such quick succession 
that the reader doesn't get a chance to stay grounded in a single place for very long. The narrator here doesn't really invite the reader onto the scene. It's almost like a montage of the town from the outsider's perspective. An image of boats, a flicker of trees, a lingering shot of the processions, and a dance in the streets. Is this telescope perspective? Maybe not purely, but I wouldn't say we've fully zoomed in yet, either. The duration isn't clear, but it certainly isn't years like the Sagan excerpt. There's also quite a bit to visualize, though no specific cues to recenter the reader to a clear place in the story world. There's no dialogue, and not even a character per se, more like a number of figures in the distance to be observed. It still seems that the narrator is seeking to present this city as a place to be observed safely from afar. Le Guin's narrator doesn't invite the reader into the story for most of it, and then she zooms in at a very specific moment to a very specific purpose. If you haven't read this story yet, read it. Find yourself a copy of The Ones Who Walk Away from Omalas and read it. Watch Ursula do work. Her treatment of narrative distance in this story is one of the features that makes this a piece of fiction that will endure. Not many authors can do what she can do in five pages. Let's get closer. For that, we're going to need our virtual reality headset. Ryan contrasted her telescope perspective with the idea of zooming right onto the scene of the action. Here, the story's center of consciousness shifts to the site of the fictional narrative. We get close. Here's a Raymond Carver narrator telling us a story of a young couple happening upon a yard sale with no purveyor. The entire bedroom set is out on the lawn. As they start to get comfortable, the seller returns. The man came down the sidewalk with a sack from the market. He had sandwiches, beer, whiskey. He saw the car in the driveway and the girl on the bed. He saw the television set going and the boy on the porch. Hello, the man said to the girl. You found the bed. That's good. Hello, the girl said and got up. I was just trying it out. She patted the bed. It's a pretty good bed. It's a good bed, the man said and put down the sack and took out the beer and the whiskey. We thought nobody was here, the boy said. We we're interested in the bed and maybe the TV. Also, maybe the desk. How much do you want for the bed? I was thinking fifty dollars for the bed, the man said. Would you take forty? the girl asked. I'll take forty, the man said. He took a glass out of the carton. He took the newspaper off the glass. He broke the seal on the whiskey. How about the TV? the boy said. Twenty five. Would you take fifteen? the girl said. Fifteen's okay. I could take fifteen, the man said. The girl looked at the boy. You kids, you want a drink, the man said. Glasses in that box. I'm going to sit down on the sofa. The man sat on the sofa, leaned back, and stared at the boy and the girl. Carver's language is never ornate. It's often so plain he's been accused of being a minimalist, whatever that means. His narrator's cues are certainly enough to get us onto the scene, though. The man coming down the sidewalk gives the reader a place to start, followed quickly by, he saw the car in the driveway and the girl on the bed. If we were going to pinpoint a moment of recentering, this might be it, and the narrator stays centered in this perspective. He saw the television set going and the boy on the porch. So now the reader has a few cues to begin to put together the story world space. The reader can mentally triangulate the three characters from the man's perspective, and the scene unfolds from there. Note that Carver's narrator offers specific actions to visualize that break up the dialogue. The girl pats the bed, the man gets out a glass and cracks open the whiskey. The girl and the boy look at each other. The dialogue, mundane as it may seem, also keeps the scene moving along at the speed of life. It may very well seem like there isn't much going on here in this place, but we're in it. We're there with these characters in this place. Carver's narrator recentered the reader's consciousness to this story world. There are a few things to note. Again, duration is almost perfectly executed to cue scene. Dialogue and short visual actions, while descriptions are limited to the mere presence of objects, a bed, a car, a sack, a TV, a sofa, whiskey, beer. It's all the reader needs to know to picture these objects. The narrator leaves it to the reader to add the details as they see fit. Could we get closer? Definitely. One thing Ryan highlights as a key to deep immersion is the illusion of the narrator's absence. In order to truly experience the feeling of getting sucked into a book, readers must also forget that they're reading a book at all. This means that the very convention of a narrator reminds the reader they're reading a book. 
thereby hindering deep immersion. In order to get really close, the narrator needs to disappear, and Carver's narrator doesn't quite do that. The repetition in dialogue tags particularly. The man said, the boy said, the girl said, the man said. This draws attention to the presence of the narrator. It also tends to prohibit deep immersion in the story world. There's also another important point we'll explore in detail in a couple lessons. The reader never gets the perceptions of these characters. All the actions described are external and can be observed from the perspective of the imaginary recentered consciousness on the scene. It's almost like we're on this scene watching the characters, but we don't get to share in their insights. We get, hello, the girl said, and got up, instead of, the girl saw the man approach, watching her as she lay on the bed. She felt a tinge of embarrassment wash over her face. She quickly sat up and said hello. Carver's approach is more cinematic than empathic here. His narrator doesn't give us any of the character's internal feelings. Let's look at a narrator who does. This is Ken Kesey's iconic narrator from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Chief. He's about to describe the moment Nurse Ratched enters the story. I'm mopping near the ward door when a big key hits it from the other side. And I know it's the big nurse by the way the lockworks cleave to the key. Soft and swift and familiar, she'd been around locks so long. She slides through the door with a gust of cold and locks the door behind her. And I see her fingers trail across the polished steel. Tip of her fingers, same color as her lips. Funny orange, like the tip of a soldering iron. Color so hot or so cold, if she touches you with it, you can't tell which. Enter the villain. And you're there, right? Mopping the floor with the chief? This is on the second page of the book, and the reader has already taken up residence with him. It's not that Kesey's chief is giving the reader perceptions directly. He doesn't say he hears the key. Note the diction. I'm mopping near the ward door when a key hits it from the other side, and I know it's the big nurse by the way the lockworks cleave to the key. It's not just that he hears this key. He hears it in a way that tells you so much about both characters, that he's been there long enough he can tell a newbie from the big nurse, from behind a locked door, by the sound of the way she handles her keys. And that gives you cause to trust his opinion of her, which he presents as only the chief could. The cold rushes in with her. He sees her touching the steel door with her funny orange fingertips like a soldering iron. Damn, and I'm there. I'm in it. The narrator has totally disappeared into this character, and the real world has evaporated. This is total recentering to a fictional universe. Virtual reality distance achieved. So here are some of the tools of virtual reality distance. Duration should be seen or near to seen. Dialogue and brief actions help the cause. There should be numerous elements to visualize, whether objects, space, or actions. Details should be brief enough to keep the duration at or near scene, but vivid enough to cue a reader to experience internal perceptions or thoughts of the character. The narrator should be inconspicuous. Character narrators are excellent for this because they disappear naturally into their story world. So that's the entire spectrum, from telescope distance to the virtual reality headspace of one of the characters. We'll get into specifics of perspective in a bit when we talk about viewpoint. But before I leave this topic, there are a few things to say about using these tools. Ryan concludes her discussion on the matter by putting it this way. This experience of being transported onto the narrative scene is so intense and demanding on the imagination that it cannot be sustained for a very long time. An important aspect of narrative art consists, therefore, of varying the distance, just as a sophisticated movie will vary the focal length of the camera lens. Mary Laura Ryan's certainly right about great writers varying distance. Ishmael moves the reader right back out to telescope distance after Queequeg's dramatic rescue, and Le Guin's narrator stays out until it's the exact right time to move the reader in. I tend to think that the imagination might be a bit more resilient than Ryan seems to give it credit for. But even if it is, there's something here for a writer to think about. Say you could move your reader into a character's headspace and keep them locked in that viewpoint with one vivid image after another, immersing them in an action-packed story from cover to cover. Is that the best move? There's a video of the great Luciano Pavarotti giving a masterclass, and I absolutely love it. The singer he coaches in this video is wonderful. Pava sits quietly, and as this baritone sings an aria, he listens, and to the untrained ear, the baritone is marvelous, a lively, powerful, brilliant voice without flaw. 
and Pavarotti sits there smiling. I think because he's enjoying how well the man sings, but also because he knows that he could be better. When the singer finishes, Pavarotti praises him genuinely on the way he sang the first verse. Then Pava asks him why he sang the second verse the exact same way. The aria repeats, but music stays the same, Pavarotti states. The top is fantastic. The color of the voice is beautiful. Except they will tell you after 20 bars, beautiful voice, now change the color. If they don't hear you change the color, then... Then Pava shrugs. You have to feel for a guy who gets called to a stage in front of hundreds of people to sing Verdi and be critiqued on it by Pavarotti, no matter how great his voice. And that's it. Straight from Mary Lore Ryan and Luciano Pavarotti. Great writers master distance, moving their readers in and out at the moments in the story it counts most, just like a singer varying the color in his voice, sometimes quiet, sometimes loud. I'll leave you with this from the master himself. You can do, don't worry, you can do. Don't be afraid, even if it's difficult, if it's the first time you don't feel uh, very comfortable, you will find your way to do this. But you have to do, to not escape the problem because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. You have to do. Amen and bravo, Pava. We miss you, big guy. <laughs>